Hi everyone. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Arthur and I'm an undergraduate here at Duke uh, and the student director of the Duke Catholic Center Lecture Series program. Uh, so our team, firstly, we would greatly appreciate it if you can sign in in one of the sheets that is located um, on the side of each row if you haven't done so. Um, especially if you're interested in being part of the lecture series email list um, and you haven't been added, uh, then you're definitely welcome to write down your email on the sign-up sheet also. Uh, so today, uh, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, our speaker today, Amy Maxey. Amy Maxey is currently a third year doctoral student in the field of systematic theology at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, her dissertation project involves the retrieval of mystical theology for constructive projects in systematic theology. Uh, she has written on figures from mystical traditions such as Catherine of Siena, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, um, Meister Eckhart, as well as contemporary figures such as Carl Raymer and Sarah Copley. She earned a Bachelor's in Religious Studies from Duke University uh, in 2013, uh, as well as a Master's of Theological Studies uh, from the University of Notre Dame. So to begin, uh, let's just start off with a brief prayer uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, we're just grateful uh, to gather here today um, to hear different ways that you're speaking to our hearts, God. So I just pray that the Holy Spirit will fill this room, uh, so fill Amy's heart uh, as she speaks to us about uh, Mary as well as Martha. We're grateful for you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So yeah, we're very blessed to have a Duke alum uh, to speak with us today, and let's give us a warm welcome uh, to Amy Maxi. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me over the huge? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to start off uh, by thanking the Duke Catholic Center for inviting me to uh, come give this lecture. Uh, it's always great to be back in Durham. Uh, my stomach, especially, appreciates eating Durham food. Again, it's been a long time. And uh, when I was an undergraduate many, many years ago, I uh, helped organize some of the early Catholic Center lectures. So it's very gratifying to see that there's still uh, people interested in coming to engage a little bit more deeply uh, with their faith and with the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, I hope it's okay if I stick to my script uh, for you guys. I haven't quite mastered the Father Mike just walking around. <laughs> All right, well, as you uh, hopefully already know, uh, tonight's lecture is on the subject of action and contemplation. And I thought it might be a good idea to start out by sketching what these two terms have uh, traditionally meant in the Catholic tradition. So simply put, uh, action has referred to uh, charitable good works, uh, the works that we perform out of love for our neighbor, um, and what both theologians and philosophers have called the virtuous life. What does it mean to live a good life? And contemplation has encompassed a wide variety of Christian prayer practices, uh, including meditation on scripture, Eucharistic adoration, solitary prayer. Um, and these broad terms have been used to describe uh, Christian responses to the dual command to love God above all things, and love one's neighbor as oneself. Now, in the 21st century, the question of how Christians ought to live is more complicated and urgent than ever. And one traditional way of answering this question has been to think about the relationship between the life of prayer and the life of service. The classic approach to this topic comes in the form of reflection upon the parable of Mary and Martha, which is Luke 10, 38 through 42. This has often been understood as delineating two modes of life for Christians. The life dedicated to contemplative prayer, typified by Mary, and the life focused on active service, typified by Martha. This understanding occurs as early in the Christian tradition as the third century, so it goes way back. We're gonna to turn to this parable in a few moments, uh, but since many of you are probably already familiar a little bit with this story, you might already have a feeling that you're more of a Mary or more of a Martha. You can think quietly to yourself. I'm not going to make you raise hands you know, <laughs> to, see, to see where we stand in the room. But I do want to say, I think there's a commonly held understanding in today's church uh, that if you're really a Mary, like really into the contemplative life, 
St. Bernard recognizes that this order sometimes requires the subordination of one's own desire for contemplation in order to actively serve the good of others. This is especially necessary if God has granted someone a particular duty of charity. So, for example, St. Bernard was in charge of an abbey full of monks, um, and this often required him to be more concerned with their welfare rather than spend his time in contemplation, which is what he really desired. Now, what Bernard says about the order of love lays the ground for what he, how he describes the relationship of Mary and Martha a little bit later on in his sermon series. He describes their relationship as one not of opposition, but of deep sisterly harmony. St. Bernard envisions this harmony as a proper ordering of the two loves for God and neighbor in terms of a rhythm passing between contemplation and action. St. Bernard writes, quote, the contemplative who falls away from contemplation takes refuge in action, from which she will surely return to contemplation as from an adjoining place with greater intimacy. Since these two are comrades and live together, for Martha is sister to Mary. And though she loses the light of contemplation, she does not permit herself to fall into the darkness of sin or the idleness of sloth, but holds herself within the light of good works. St. Bernard is pretty realistic. No Christian can be a Mary at all times, as no one can continually sit at prayer for every moment of every day. But the act of life is not denigrated. Rather, it's a place of refuge from sin and sloth that keeps the Christian in a state of active love towards his or her neighbor. St. Bernard takes this sisterly harmony further in Sermon 57, where he talks about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, their brother, as three endowments of one soul, related to those three persons living in one house, the Savior's intimate friends. He says, We discover Martha as the Savior's, Savior's friend and those who do the daily chores. We find Lazarus and the novices just now dead to their sins. We find a contemplative Mary and those who, cooperating with God's grace over a long period of time, have attained to a better and happier state. Thus, St. Bernard emphasizes the connectedness of these two forms of life. He writes that there are two rooms that share a wall, two sisters with the same mother, two friends of the same Lord. This emphasis on the familial relationship between these two sisters allows us to envision a more harmonious picture of the rhythm between action and contemplation. So let's ask again, are you more of a Mary or more of a Martha? Taking St. Bernard's cue, we might ask, do you spend time as a Mary and as a Martha? When not in prayer, do you take refuge in good works? Do you allow God to season you by going to God in prayer and allowing divine grace to work within you? Now, St. Bernard of Clairvaux was not the only Christian mystic to read the story of Mary and Martha in this kind of dynamic way. Several centuries later, 14th century, a German Dominican by the name of Meister Eckhart preached a sermon which radically reconfigured the relationship between action and contemplation. Before Eckhart, most other writers in the Christian tradition held that contemplation was of a higher rank than action. This is exactly what Thomas Aquinas says, another doctor of the church. But Eckhart's exegesis of Luke 10 initially inverts the traditional reading, such that Martha ranks higher than Mary. How does he do this? I know you're all just dying to know. <laughs> Eckhart suggests that both the active life and the contemplative life are good in their own ways. But if the Christian becomes too attached to the goods of either of these two modes of life, there's a danger that she might neglect one mode of life in favor of the other. Instead, Eckhart suggests that over time, we can learn to be active contemplatives and be contemplative in our actions. Eckhart makes a really bold interpretive move in this sermon. He's famous for this kind of thing. Instead of reading Martha's words to Jesus as antagonistic towards Mary, Eckhart casts her words in terms of endearment. He writes that Martha, rich with the knowledge from her life experience, recognized with some alarm that her sister was 
overwhelmed by a desire for the complete fulfillment of her soul. Eckert writes that Mary feared that her dear Mary, that Martha feared that her dear Mary was sitting there more for enjoyment than for spiritual profit. Eckert reads Jesus as offering a comforting message to Martha. It says basically, cheer up, Martha. Though Martha is worried and anxious about her sister, Jesus promises that Mary will not become inordinately attached to her desire for spiritual graces, such that she neglects the requirements of active Christian living. And Eckert ends his sermon by recounting a medieval legend that after Pentecost, Mary followed the other disciples in going out to all the corners of the world to preach the gospel. Now, Martha's concern that Mary is enjoying the company of Jesus too much may sound really odd to our modern ears. Surely, being in the presence of the Lord is enjoyable. Surely, it's not wrong to want to sit at Jesus' feet. But this danger makes more sense if we consider Meister Eckhart's context, because in his time, there were some Christians who contended that good works and charitable service just didn't matter so long as somebody was united contemplatively to God. The truly advanced Christians could live the contemplative life at all times. So on the surface, this seems to be kind of the opposite of what we might say today in our culture of productivity, right? Contemplation was seen as more valuable for one's soul than action. But maybe we could think about attempting to live a life only of contemplation as like trying to amass the most spiritual value in our life that we possibly could. In Eckert, and other church officials, of course, thought that it was necessary to stress that we never move entirely beyond the requirements of virtue and uh, active love to our neighbor. <coughs> Eckert, oops, let me get some water. Getting too excited up here, guys. <laughs> church officials were worried that people uh, who were so invested in the contemplative life would forget about the other requirements of living a life of charity and act of love towards one's neighbor. And Eckert <coughs> points to the example of the apostles and the Virgin Mary and of course Jesus. He says they were not just contemplatives. They actively performed good works. I mean, Jesus didn't, like, come down to earth just to pray, right? So the heart of the issue for Eckert is where I think what Eckert has to say is really challenging for us today. Because the heart of the issue for Eckert concerns what is the object of human desire? <coughs> Do we merely desire that which is good or pleasurable for us? Or can our desire be detached from ourselves. That is, <clears throat> can our desire be purged of its selfishness, such that when we perform good works, we do so out of an appropriate desire to serve God. And when we contemplate God, we do so out of an appropriate desire for God, not just for the pleasure that union with God brings to us. Is such a thing even possible? As Eckert tells it, Martha recognizes, <clears throat> Martha recognizes that attachment to one's desires, even desires as noble as contemplating the Lord, can be detrimental to the spiritual life if not balanced with active life of virtue and charity. Contemplation focuses us inwardly, and action focuses us outside of ourselves. In that sense, it's because of her inner disposition that Eckert judges Martha's model of active life to be better than Mary's. Eckert preaches that Martha is able to go about unimpeded in her daily works, performing all of her works properly according to the image of eternal light. In other words, her good works are performed... <coughs> Excuse me, sorry guys. In other words... Martha's good works are performed without becoming too emotionally attached to them, because she's able to see them properly in the light of God. That is, 
she is detached from herself and focused solely on God. Thus, Eckert gives us a different picture of the relationship between action and contemplation, which, as I've already said, is often described as being contemplative in action. From an exterior perspective, both action and contemplation are key components of Christian life. But interiorly, our desire for union with God should be pure regardless of whether we're engaged in activity or contemplation at any given moment. Eckert seems to set a pretty high bar for us, right? Because it asks us to question <coughs> our presuppositions about the distinctions we typically draw between the two. Anybody have a mint? <laughs> <laughs> you okay? I, I, I think so. I've been fighting something off for about a week, so. Okay. But you guys can contemplate quietly. So. <laughs> <laughs> With Eckert's kind of radical rereading of this Mary Martha parable, I think it challenges us to think that the most important, hold on, let me get a mentor song. <laughs> Need more water too, or uh, no? I found a little bit. Maybe okay. you will solve it. <laughs> I don't know if this is happening around Duke, but around Notre Dame, since all the students came back, there's like you know lots of germs from different parts of the country and stuff. So that's why I'm under the weather. <laughs> I didn't hear that, I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> I, th I, th I think I'll be okay. You guys are being very gracious. All right. So, Eckert's um, like radical rereading of this, um, this parable of Mary and Martha <coughs> really challenges us uh, to think not only if Christian just like ought to live either an active life or a contemplative life. Because I think Eckert really challenges us to search the depths of our own hearts to determine if our desire is focused unwaveringly upon God regardless of what we're doing. Ultimately, prayer and service are not about us. They're about others. They're about other people and they're about God. So I want to ask again, are you more of a Mary or more of a Martha? Taking Meister Eckert's reading, do you perform your active service out of a pure desire for God? Or do you spend time in prayer out of a pure desire for God? Do we either serve or contemplate because we think it will benefit, <coughs> because we think it will benefit us, or because we desire the glory of God? more of a Mary? Are we more of a Martha? Are we able to be contemplative while performing active service? Do we live as though our contemplative practices maybe excuse us from active service? I think that there are no longer any simple questions with simple answers. Instead, we're challenged to be uncomfortably honest in evaluating how I live as Christian. Moreover, this is particularly important for us, who are often so focused on being productive. Because Eckert's vision dissolves the strict distinctions between action and contemplation, and emphasizes our intentions towards God. Are we intentional in all of our actions, both those
those of service and those of prayer. Now, I have one more mystic I'd like to bring up before uh, we move on to some concluding thoughts. Um, the final mystic is my favorite of all the mystics. His name is Blessed Jan van Ruysbroek. He's Dutch. As with all good uh, doctoral research, you've probably never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, lived in the 14th century, and he wrote a short treatise called The Spiritual Espousals. Uh, and he talks, about, it's divided into three parts, the act, one on the active life, one on the interior life, and one on the contemplative life. In each stage of his book, Roysberg aims to explain how the Christian is progressively drawn up to participate in the inner life of the Trinity. Now to understand what he says about action and contemplation, we actually kind of have to start with his Trinitarian theology. So bear with me. You guys are already bearing with me, so you're doing great. <laughs> Roysbrook envisions the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one of continual loving movement says that the Son and the Holy Spirit flow out from the Father due to the fruitful nature of divine love. And they also flow back into the divine unity. And in unity is where all three members of the Trinity kind of rest together in enjoyment of one another. This is really dynamic. In another place, <coughs> he says that the Father moves out to the Son, and the Son turns back to the Father. And in their meeting, that is, amidst the flowing out and flowing back, the Holy Spirit arises out of their mutual love. And the Spirit, as their love, then embraces the Father and the Son as it flows back towards them. And all this activity, all this flowing in and out, kind of culminates in a blissful enjoyment. And Royce Brick suggests that this movement of rest, movement of love is occurring somehow simultaneously in a way that's kind of beyond our mere human understanding. But this is not just merely a nice picture of what the Trinity is like. In fact, the entire thrust of Roysbrook's theology is that this dynamism between the active movement and contemplative rest within the Trinity actually extends to the relationship between God and the human person. He says, this flowing forth of God constantly demands a flowing back again. For God is a flowing and ebbing sea, which ceaselessly flows out into all of his beloved, according to their needs and merits. And it flows back with all those upon whom he has bestowed his gifts in heaven and on earth, together with all that they possess or are capable of. So God's love flows out upon creation. And this love is received whenever Christians open their heart to receive God's grace. Yet it's not enough simply for the Christian to kind of like receive God's love and let it in there. God's love is so powerful and abundant that it overflows the Christian. She herself gets swept up into the movement of divine love. So the Christian response to God's love must be active in some way. The Christian returns the gift of God's love through good works, liturgical practices, prayer. And all this is done in the Holy Spirit, who is both the giver of virtue and also enables the return of one works back to God. So put another way, Roysbrook believes that the demands of Christian charity <coughs> enable the Christian to be a vessel through which God's goodness flows upon all of creation. So for Roysbrook, Progression in the spiritual life consists of the Christian's kind of increasing ability to engage in contemplation of God and active service towards one's neighbor. Moreover, both contemplation and action are able to become participation in the Trinitarian life of love. The more one serves others, the more she participates in spreading God's loving goodness throughout creation. And the more one contemplates God, the deeper she's able to return to God. The Christian's life is thus considered as an ebb and flow of action and contemplation, which is drawn up into the ebb and flow of the divine life itself. It's hard to imagine a stronger affirmation of the necessity of both action and contemplation, as together 
they imitate and are incorporated into the essential movement of the triune God. So once again, are you more of a Mary or are you more of a Martha? When we pray, are we being caught up by divine love to rest with God? When we serve others, are we participating in the outpouring of love of God? Does our contemplation, that is, our resting with God, empower us to serve others? Does our service to others enrich us so that we return to prayer of, with God, we come back with more than we started out with? These are, I think, the questions that Royce Brooks Integration of Action and Contemplation lead us to ask of ourselves. And the greatest challenge of appropriating Royce Brooks' idea of the integration of contemplation and action in our culture of productivity perhaps lies in the way in which it totally reorients our values back to God. Our lives as Christians are not about getting ahead. Our lives are about loving God and neighbor. Service for others is not merely action. Prayer is not merely contemplation. Rather, these are the ways in which we are divinized as adopted children of God. <clears throat> now, all of these writers, all these mystics, envision the relationship between action and contemplation to be more dynamic and more complicated than a simple reduction to one being better than the other. Early in this lecture, I suggested that <clears throat> in our, the church as we know it today, there may be a feeling that those whose spiritualities are more contemplative can do the contemplative stuff, and those of us who feel more called to activity can take care of all the active stuff. As if, you know, the concerns of social justice and the concerns of prayer are somehow competitive with one another. And I find it very significant that all three of the mystics that I spoke about, and many others that I didn't have time to speak about, they've all suggested that we're here to be both active and contemplative. It's not that action is reserved for some members of the church and contemplation is reserved for other members. Instead, our action ought to be intentional and contemplative, and our contemplation ought to nourish our loving service to others. Of course, again, there's nothing wrong with feeling you know, more drawn to one or the other. But perhaps we should challenge ourselves a little more with the dimension of Christian life which we find more difficult. It's often how God invites us to grow as Christians. In this task, uh, we can be helped by bringing dimensions of action and contemplation together. Those of us who routinely engage in service to the marginalized, that may struggle to have a daily prayer life, could, for example, commit to praying for the marginalized for a set amount of time every day. Those of us who have more contemplative personalities, we may need to be uh, challenged to commit to regular community service. The possibilities are really endless. What I've said tonight pertains to our understanding of the relationship between action and contemplation, which I want to say is important in its own right, because without seriously thinking about the issues involved in Christian living, we can't open our imaginations wide enough to consider all the possibilities for living out the gospel. But the far more difficult no less important task of attempting to live out a life that integrates the two is something that each of us have to personally discern. I think that we can be greatly helped in this task by attending to the lives of the saints. Though some saints live more contemplative modes of life, some live more actively, there's no saint, I wager, that lived only an active or only a contemplative life said each of the saints had his or her own unique way of balancing the demands of prayer and the demands of Christian charity. All three of the mystics that I've mentioned helped administer religious communities while maintaining an active life of writing and preaching and uh, charity. So we too must find the proper relationship between action and contemplation that aligns with our personalities, our capabilities, and our vocations. True Christian action and contemplation challenges us to go deeper into scripture, deeper into our hearts and desires, deeper into the needs of our neighbors, and ever deeper into the will of God. The sisterly relationship of action and contemplation suggests that social action ought to be imbued with prayer, that prayer ought
to nourish a life of service and advocacy for those in need. This is necessary for Christians living, seeking to live the gospel in a way that addresses the needs of our time, especially considering the way in which our culture of productivity makes it difficult to find moments of silence to spend with God. It makes it challenging to serve others in a way that so it's not just like one more thing that to do on our to-do list. So perhaps if we can be a little more active in practicing daily prayer and reading scripture, and a little more prayerful in our activity and our relationships with our neighbors, we too will choose the better part, which will not be taken from us. Thanks, guys. So now we'll just open up for questions. So uh, if you have any things to ask, Amy, yeah, it's a good time to do so. I'm going to eat some oranges if that's some service to their own church, but they're not, like, doing service in a wider uh, meaning of the word, but, uh, and some of them are really well-known saints, like St. Chargo, St. Uh, there are a lot of saints that are still, uh, nowadays do daily miracles, some of them, like, you hear uh, even, like, one miracle every few minutes and stuff like that. I don't care much about that, but what's your comment on these saints and uh, how they live? Mm -hmm. They were a lot of one side, and it worked for them. Yeah, that's a really great question. I um, tend to follow Thomas Merton on this. He was a 20th century, um, oh, goodness, what, Cistercian? Trappist? He was a Trappist one. Um, and the way he talks about, uh, what that? the way he talks about this is that it's important for people who feel that they have a particular calling to be a hermit, somebody who you know, kind of like lives by themselves um, and is very like, strictly devoted to a life of prayer. He suggests that it's important for these people to discern this life path within a religious community, not only because practically a religious community can support somebody uh, practically, you know, with like feeding them and taking care of their space to live and that sort of thing, but it also provides some sort of like physical tie with other people, even if it is very limited and not um, as robust as we may think of like living in normal society. But I think many um, people who have dedicated their lives to living alone in prayer really see their prayer as a kind of act of service. Right? They're not just praying for themselves, and they're not just um, trying to attain union with God, but they're praying for the needs of the world. And in that way, it's uh, still kind of a, a way of showing charity to one's neighbor. And it's like, it definitely a unique, um, maybe even like intensely contemplative way. Uh, but I think the self-understanding for many of the people who have this vocation is that the way that they can actively love and serve their neighbor is specifically by praying for them. Did any of the, your, it could be the three that you mentioned or others, um, <coughs> comment on um, the necessary patience uh, that we must have with ourselves for this um, uh, setting our love in order or reordering it um, because it it, um, it makes complete sense what you're saying but I'm frequently impatient and with myself and with others <laughs> yeah well so most of um, the mystics that I'm talking about and throughout the tradition uh, in, in one way the religious life which has kind of like set training periods that somebody has to progress through is a way of kind of working patience into the system, right? So nobody just like walks into a monastery one day and then becomes like a full-fledged monk, right? There's like some uh, intense training that goes along. And when we talk about ascetical practices, the word ascesis 
uh, literally means in Greek training, like athletic training, right? So, uh, like, it's, it's not the case that anybody in the mystical tradition really thinks that, you know, we can just kind of like flip a switch and suddenly we've got our love in order, we are able to properly be contemplative, we're able to properly serve, et cetera, et cetera. But it is an ascesis, a lifelong training exercise, so that as um, you know, we progress in the spiritual life, we are also progressing in love of neighbor. Um, a famous theologian talking about Roisbrook talks about it as a, like ascending spiral. So we're constantly circling back to the things that we've already maybe encountered, the things that we need to keep working on. But hopefully the, the progress is still ongoing, even if we're you know, kind of coming back to things that we still need to work on. Thank you for being with us today, Mika. Uh, just another round of applause for you. Yeah. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you guys the next time.